travelers. We were aware that your journey was difficult, but prepare to have your questions answered, for you have been granted an audience with the Masters of Modern. Welcome back to Masters of Modern. I'm your host, Alex Kessler, here with my co-host, Michael Grothy. Hi, everyone. High five. All right. Well, we got All a right. lot of cards to get through today, so yeah. let's dive right TF in. All right. So today we're doing our third part of our set review for Modern Horizons, the new hotness set that's coming out. If you need to find us, there's a whole audio clip that's going to play right now that tells you how to find us and what stuff is important to pay attention to. What's up, guys? Masters of Modern here. I'm Ben Bateman. I'm Alex Kessler. And we've got a couple quick shout outs for you guys that we wanted to remind you of on this episode. The first one is Twitter at the MMCast. We've had a Twitter for years. It's a great place to interact with us. We post exclusive images of our brand new spoiler cards, all kinds of cool stuff. Check it out at the MMCast. It is a great way to support the show. Kess, where can the folks find you personally? I'm at Kess Wiley. You guys can find me at Ben Bateman Media. The second thing is we have a YouTube. You may be watching this right now, honestly. You might be listening to it. But one of the big pushes for us in 2019 is to build this YouTube channel. We want to get more eyes, more ears, bigger guests, better episodes, higher production quality. We even hired a producer right now, so you might even see the camera angles change subscribe like comment it's going really well so far and honestly if you guys support it even if you're an audio listener already it's a huge thing you can do to help us grow this the third thing and maybe the most important thing for our long-term health is patreon.com slash the mm cast guys this year is going to have a ton of cool rewards for you we really want to make the patreon feel special and it's a great way to help us grow our ability to hire the producer to get new gear to do anything cool in the future is going to be dependent on our ability to actually pay for it. Because right now, Alex and I are just paying out of pocket for the show. You know, we love it, but that's what we're doing. Well, and, and the producer will help us kind of make sure we stay on stuff on Patreon. So it'll be a really thriving community. Yeah. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is the command zone. Jimmy Wong, Josh Lee Kwai, these guys helped us start this thing. Mm-hmm. Collected.companies, where you can find their stuff. They're seriously the most professional magic people in the world. Not named Ben and Alex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they make awesome content every week. Commander Focus. They do game nights. They do uh, the command zone is the, obviously the podcast, the sister podcast of the MMCast. Check them out. Collected.company. It's the same place you can find our episodes every week as well. And the last thing is if you guys want to check out a great community, check out the Facebook group, the Masters of Modern. There's a ton of people in there. It's very very interactive. There are constantly threads about new decks, new conversations. Uh, it's very active. Check it out. That's uh, Facebook, the official Masters of Modern group. And otherwise, let's get back to the show. Yep. Thanks, guys. Man, that's a lot of stuff. I'm really glad all you guys are paying attention to it. Just a second reminder, because it's really important. Subscribe on YouTube, hit the bell button, do it, uh, and check out the Patreon. There's a bunch of new exclusive stuff that I'll break down at the end of the episode that's going on there. New uh, and improved Patreon. New and improved Patreon. Um, today, we are doing the third part, so we're for sure talking about red and green cards, and we're going to try our hardest to make it so this isn't a four-part episode, though I have... Or a three-and-a-half part. Minimal, th- minimal, <laughs> minimal faith. Uh, two other important things before we get started. Uh, we have a live show at GP, uh, or now Magic Fest Seattle. So make sure to go to uh, t- that. If you're at Magic Fest Seattle, come say hi. We'll be jamming games. I'm not playing the event. I'm just trying to play out with you guys. Do you know if Channel Fireball Magic. is recording it? I do not. I will find out and tweet about it at the time. So we make can put sure it in the description of the video too. Right? Yeah, we can put a link to it in the description of the video. So that'll be there. And then the other thing is next week is our preview episode. So normally your episodes come out at different times tomorrow. Next week on Monday, we'll have our uh, free official preview from Wizards of Coast for Core Set 2020. It's a doozy. Uh, get hyped. It's exciting. Uh, all right. Now, today, we're going to be doing red first, then green, and then hopefully lands, then hopefully artifacts, then hopefully gold cards in some amount of that order. First card. Lava Dart. Red, instant, Lava Dart deals one damage to any target. Flashback, sacrifice a mountain. That's a free spell. That Yeah, it's, a, it's, just, it's free. Sacking a mountain. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you don't have to spend mana on it. True. That is powerful. Yes, and so worst case scenario, this is shock, but you want for one more mana and sacking that mountain that you probably... That's spend. like pretty bad, though. I mean, that's forked bolt. So yeah, yeah. You can split up the damage. But yeah, I mean, it kills random noble hierarchs. You can discard it to Faith Saluting, and it's not embarrassing. It's easily your third spell to bring back Phoenix. I mean, yeah, I think it's... Uh, See, that's that's the big thing that's already seeing play in is, is we're yeah. just talking about, you know, fat... Faith the Saluting wants cards to discard that you basically read. You draw that card instead of discarding it. Um... Lava Dart allows you to do that, but then also single-handed, or not single-handed, but it plus one, any other card gets Phoenix back. Like, it does a lot yeah. of really powerful things there, and you'd be surprised how many X1s are in the format, not to mention X2s in the worst-case scenarios. Yeah. yeah, and it can go to the face. Yeah. 
Uh, next card is Reckless Charge. So this is one red sorcery target creature gets plus three plus zero and gains haste until end of turn. It has flashback two and a red. Um, I, this is already starting to see play in some in fact lists that are splashing red that I've seen. And then also there's a mod like I guess you can kill someone on turn one if you have the exact seven cards, but on turn two, the haste giving that's a part of it is the more important feature. Sure. I mean, I can see this in like a Kiln Fiend, Monasteries with Spear. I mean, basically any deck that wants to play Team or Battle Rage could play this card now. Yeah. And, and I don't think and, it's going to be a four of ever anywhere, but sure. it is a card that you can just like, you know, be do, another copy of like a pump spell for your, your kiln fiend or whatever. I, I do think this does have a great, this more than most other cards gives a reason for in fact to start splashing red partially because of the haste and plus three plus zero. So you can just kill people like if they tap out and they don't like you don't have a creature in place. So they think you're just not going to have any threats on your next turn. You can just play this and win. Um, next, and this is definitely one of my picks for favorite cards in the set. I don't know if it's the most powerful, but it's definitely the dopest. Uh, Goblin Engineer, one in a red, uh, creature Goblin artifer, Artificer. It's a one-two. When Goblin Engineer enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an artifact card. Put it into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. Red, tap, sacrifice an artifact. Return target artifact card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So there's two, there's three parts of this card. The first one is less relevant due to what it's doing. It's a Goblin the big thing, and to me, the most important thing, actually, more than even the sacrifice ability, is it's Entomb for Artifacts. Yeah. Um, this is the only Entomb in Modern that I know of that's not on the very expensive creature or some like expensive spell that probably exists. When Goblin Enforcer enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an artifact oh, card. Oh, what, so we're Entombing and then using Trash for Treasure to bring it back? Yeah, or Trash for Treasure is probably the best example, though Though you can get Inkwell Leviathan and then just use any reanimation spell in the format, or you can get sure. Sundering, um, Titan, or Sundering Titan or... Uh, What's the any of the mere superior or not mere battle superior, sphere battle? Yeah, mere battle. Sphere. You can reanimate mere superior with this. You though. can't straight up. I mean, Where's Ben? Long. This is such a, we need we need Ben in here for Goblin Engineer. Uh, wait, wait. He did text me because he think yeah he, he texted about. us and this unearth. It was in our Masters of Modern yeah, group chat. Goblin can, Engineer unearth claim fame mere superior some sort of toolbox claim fame deck scholar revoker now spell bomb etc. Sick. Is the <laughs> so yeah, I think that Sculler with this card is a very Ben interaction because you can like search for Sculler with this and then or even if you don't search for Sculler with this, if you play Sculler, you can respond to Sculler's trigger by sacking it to the revoker or to the engineer. It is a pretty sweet turn three play. If you like turn two, you made the engineer going to put whatever your hate card is in the yard or a superior. Yeah, and then superior. turn three, you cast the Sculler. And with your third mana, sacrifice it so you permanently right. exile a card yeah, you, and you put the scholar trigger on the stack. Well, the fact so yeah, that with, it, with unearth and claim so that fame. they get the card back before you exile it, which does nothing, and then you exile the card permanently, and now you have a superior in play. And and just scholar. It's a Ben. Like, it's people, a Ben interaction. People play uh, Vidalia click on people's draw steps for a reason. Like yeah. being able to scholar somebody draw on their draw step, step is like really good. That's powerful. Yeah. So I think like that. Just I've that. seen this guy. I've seen this guy in some like Urza uh, Thopter Sword lists too. Mm -hmm. I've seen people playing like blue red. I mean, I think that the optimal build of those decks is going to take a while for people to figure out. But I've seen it in some like combo builds because it searches for your combo piece. And depending on what your combo piece is, it can reanimate it. And like we were saying, post board, it finds hate cards. Right. If you're like an artifact centric deck and you can even use it as a card advantage engine if you have to grind. Like mm -hmm. if you're grinding through hate, somebody has like a stony silence in play, you can like sacrifice like an Iker Wellspring to this or a Nile Spell Bomb and get the mana and like or get the card off the Nile Spell Bomb like you can use kind of these junky trinket artifacts Arkham's uh, Astrolabe. Astrolabe which we'll talk about uh, also draws a card and is cheap enough that like you can play it easily all you have to do is have a snow mana base sure. um, and so yeah I mean I think that there's like definitely some of these cheap artifact combo decks that are looking to assemble a combo that requires artifacts that Goblin Engineer can reanimate, it gives you a lot of redundancy mm -hmm. because even like it searches for the artifact or if the artifact's dead, it can just get it out of the graveyard. I think I, I do think this is on my top pick for like, and this is kind of what I <laughs> wanted from this set is like cool cards that do like eight different things, totally different than anything else exists that opens up a bunch of different possibilities. Yeah, this is a card for you to brew around. Yeah. It's not like, oh, jamming four in my Phoenix deck. Hell yeah. This is like, right. hmm, how gets do you I... thinking? Yeah. Do something it with does it. enough stuff that there's got to be a way. It's definitely a Masters of Modern card. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I wish Ben was here. He would give this Goblin Engineer the real jank treatment. 
Well, he's going to do, I think, so So we're starting to do uh, live streams on the YouTube channel where Ooh. it's just going to be straight to camera conversations. And often we'll talk about decks we've been working on, sometimes mostly modern decks, but even sometimes not the that format. I can't, Ben seems excited enough about this Tide Hollow Sculler Goblin Engineer deck that I can't imagine that's not I his I think he's next sending it to tech. us to talk about it, and we may be, well, we'll see timing of when things come out, but he's probably talking about that. And uh, so definitely check out to his live stream. Uh, shenanigans. One in a red, sorcery, destroy target artifact, dredge one. This is also a high on my list of favorite cards in the set. Red yeah, is a lot of my favorite it's cards. A, it's a pretty on-the-nose artwork since there is a lantern being smashed. Yes. And this is a card that totally hoses lantern control. Yep. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you were looking to... Like, well, like, I'm shuffling that deck at never again. Yeah, so if you were looking to use Goblin Engineer to find lock pieces and lanterns in modern, it might be a good opportunity to use it for something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... I wish we got more Dredge 1 cards. I wish there was another one. I wish there was like some other effect that we didn't get to see, but I understand why Modern, there isn't. I mean, Modern Horizons 2. Yeah. You never know. Yeah, more Dredge. Because like, dr- like this is a pr- perfect example of more Dredge. More Dredge. Dredge. How could it go wrong? <laughs> like more more Delve 2, please, while no, we're no, at no, it. No, 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 no. Never again. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> uh, all right. Next card. It's 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 a good sideboard card. Like every red deck, especially ones that have any graveyard synergy, you can take advantage of this. Speaking of cards that are great with Bedlam Revelers and it's Famous like Lootings. it's like a little bit like an ancient grudge, where like decks where you just want to shatter them multiple times. I mean, it doesn't have the card advantage aspect of ancient grudge, but it's also mono red, so you sure. can just like you know against a deck that's trying to lock you out, like Lantern, or even against. It's a little slow against Affinity, but well, but like so you know, Mardu Pyromancer decks have always wanted a like they would have loved to be able to take advantage of ancient stories and couldn't because of the lacking of green and then this is even maybe better than ancient stirrings because getting grudge. ancient grudge sorry because getting it's not better than ancient stirrings <laughs> getting five casts off of this just guarantee no longer getting a land and getting this every turn to trigger your young pyromancer yeah if there's like a deck if there's a situation where you want to draw shatter every turn this will do it and it yeah. will be one of those things where it's like my sideboard is like one shatter storm and one coligan's command and one shenanigan right. like where people People try and vary it up for different matchups. Right. This will be a card that'll be like one or two in your little artifact destruction rotation. Yeah, and and it plays well with all the decks that like to discard spells. I mean, I think that's something that was definitely a theme of this set. That's true. That. You can fate the looting it away and then get it back when your opponent is like going to combo right. off with Thopter Sword or something, and you and can blow up their like, Thopter like, Foundry. Not to mention dredge decks that just like actually need this in their graveyard more than they need it in play. Anyways. Yeah, that's true. Like all of the graveyard decks on top of that want this card more than they want. Yeah, it's most pretty good with season Pyromancer for sure. Yeah. Um. Tectonic Reformation, red one enchantment. Each land card in your hand has cycling red, uh, cycling two. Um, I think this has really two key things. The one point that Michael made is that this is basically just a red version of the blue. Trade routes. Trade routes, which has an additional ability to let you return lands to your hand for one blue mana. Yeah, from play. Uh, For playing, you draw. Well, it's it's just you can return a land to your hand from play, and then you can discard a card to draw a card. Yes, it's one colorless to return a land you control. Yeah. And then one colorless, discard a land, draw a card. And so, it's a two mana blue enchantment. Right. And it's in ninth edition or something. And so this trades the returning a land effect, being able to like turn all those lands into card draws late game into cycling, which means that it's easier to play multiples of this. Plus it can it actually uses the word cycling, which is better for all of the cycle themed astral drift decks, which is sure. definitely relevant. Um, and also just it's it's this in red. Like does I think in general red decks are looking more for this type of card advantage engine than blue is because blue has all the card advantage engines it really could ever want. Well, red is definitely actively looking for different. Sure. Ways also, if you were to build like a lands deck with like right. seismic assault or something, you would be more likely to be playing red in that deck than blue. Right. Like that. Classically, those decks are jund colored, and this is a great. Yeah, I'm that. not. I'm not a super big fan of this card. I like the cycling lands in modern, which we'll get to, but, yeah, yeah. but they are lands. This is like a card that you have to play, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's similar to any other like looting type card, like faithless looting. Obviously the rate is so powerful, but cards like that, they always are card disadvantage unless you can discard a card that's relevant, but because you're discarding lands, it's like rarely going to be relevant sure. unless you have like life in the loam or something, but it's just like you always go down a card when you play this, right? Mm-hmm. You, you have seven cards in hand, you play this, you cycle three lands, you still only have six cards in hand. Right. right. So, like, unless you're, like, really able to take advantage of those lands in your graveyard, I feel like you're better off just playing cycling lands. Cool. Now, speaking of a card that is actually seeing a lot of play, Aria of Flame, two and a red enchantment. When Aria of Flame enters the battlefield, each opponent gains ten life. 
Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a verse counter on Aria of Flame. Then it deals damage equal to the number of verse counters on it to target player or planeswalker. The main place it's seeing play right now is Storm. Uh, Storm is it's seeing, I, I think it's just uh, two of now. It's like a decks. Pyromancer Ascension that doesn't use the graveyard. Right. So I've you, seen a Phoenix deck with it too. Yeah, that was really spicy. One. I sent you that list. Yeah. I mean, anytime you can cast a bunch of cards. And I think one of the reasons that this is more playable is because of, La in Phoenix at least, is because of Lava Dart. Like just having another free spell to cast every spell that you cast with this matters so much because you have to cast four spells to break even. Mm -hmm. And if, as soon as you cast a fifth spell, you're like doming them for a lot. And, right. and obviously like you can use it over multiple turns, but this is kind of taking the place of pyromancer ascension. In a lot of these decks because both storm and Phoenix are like somewhat susceptible to grave hate. There's a lot of grave hate going around. So this is a card that allows you to like not use your graveyard, but you can still use, you know, a lot of the synergy that your deck is going for to just kill them. Right. Goblin Matron, two and a red. Creature Goblin. When Goblin Matron enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a Goblin card, reveal that card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Um, I mean, this is a classic Goblin card. This is one of like the four Goblin, or there's five, I think, Goblin cards before this set was printed that people were asking for. Uh, Goblin Matron, Goblin Ringleader. Um, Lackey. Goblin Lackey, and then Port and Wasteland. <laughs> oh, those are Goblin cards yeah. now? Sure. Well, and then there was some talk about Jim Palm Incinerator. Which we basically got Jump Palm Incinerator, but that will go over in the multicolored cards. Yeah. The modern deck that Wizards seems to want Goblins to become, like the, they have been seeding all of these pieces specifically, is more of the Fecundity Sack Outlet version of Goblins, which Goblin Matron is better in than, say, an 8 whack deck, which has been the classic Goblins list that's been going on for the last well, eight years. Well, I mean, Legacy Goblins, when it was more of a force in Legacy, was playing Matron, but... That deck was using Lackey to cheat on mana. Yeah, you were, so you were you killing could, their mana with If you had a Lackey online, you could, right, you would like try and blow up their lands. You would have Aether Vials to cheat on mana. You'd have Lackeys to cheat on mana. And you would like put Matron in with Vial in response to your Lackey trigger and basically just like put a Siege Gang Commander into play or a Krenko into play or some just like outrageously large goblin that wins by itself. That's not really as easy in modern because you have no lackeys. You have Warren Instigator is the closest thing. Which you is have Warren Instigator for a double striking Goblin Lackey. For those who don't know Goblin Lackey, when it does damage to a player, you put a Goblin from your hand into play. Right. Warren Instigator is that, but it costs two red instead of one, has double strike. So you get to put two Goblins from your hand so into what, play versus one. So what Matron allows you to do is play random one of hate cards like Gem Palm Incinerator. I mean... You were playing more incinerators, but like you could shave incinerators and find them with matron and matchups mm -hmm. where you needed it. If it was like a creature light meta, you can play like one siege gang, one cranko. You can play like, you know, one tuck tuck scrapper or something. Well, you you can play cards like that. We're not thinking of that. I don't know. They're not all great, but they are like hate cards. There are goblin hate cards. In yeah. The well, world. tuck tuck scrapper yeah, is yeah, one yeah. of them. It there destroys an goblin settler that in. destroys lands when he Yeah. Kills. Like you can play some of these like rando one of goblins that you can search for with matron. And then if they're, you can like either, and it, improves the consistency of your deck you like draw your relevant cards more mm -hmm. often because you don't just have like a handful of siege gang commanders but you basically have enough siege gang commanders in your deck because of matron sure that well, you can then like just wombo somebody with a siege gang commander on turn three or whatever well, and like blow them up it also allows you to find like the different cards you need to win with the fecundity deck because that is a combo right deck that so if we're going pieces. to combo goblins then yes so like uh the podcast spoiled skirk prospector right. and one of the things but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a reprint, so it's yeah, not yeah. as exciting. But yeah, one of the things that Skirk Prospector can do is it can combo because it's like a free sack out that generates mana, which is like very powerful right. if you can do the right things. And so there's like a Fecundity deck for people who haven't watched the Skirk Prospector episode where Fecundity is whenever a creature dies, its controller draws a card. So you have Skirk Prospector and Fecundity. You like sack your board to make a bunch of mana, draw a bunch of cards, play more goblins, sack them to make a bunch of mana, draw a bunch of cards, and, and then, then hopefully you like empty the Warrens, which makes a ton of goblins. Then you can sack them to draw more cards right. and more mana. And then you like great trap them. them. Yeah. It's, it becomes a storm deck. So, and matron allows you to find prospector. It allows you to like find a way to give your goblins haste. So you can just win off of like goblin, uh, 
tank not like king. war chief or war chieftain chief. goblin war chief or goblin chieftain to like give all your one ones haste off of empty mm-hmm. the warrens so you can just win off of empty the warrens you don't need grape shot and when well, there's like there's the new sack out like the black one that makes two goblins when it enters the play sling gang and lieutenant you can get sling, like, you can play like a one of sling gang you, lieutenant that we talked yeah. about last week that this helps you go fine so there's like and she can also just like find you more goblins if you're like going off but you like don't have any goblins in your hand you can just like play a matron to get like mog war marshal right. which like now gives you three sacks to three more looks at got for goblins she kind of like medium fecundities because she draws a card when she comes into play yeah. so at least you can chain her into the one that makes a goblin when it dies in under's play that makes three mana that's so, war marshal that's war marshal okay. yep. uh yeah speaking of goblins pashlik mons two in a red legendary creature goblin warrior whenever pashlik mons or another goblin you control dies pashlik mons deals one damage to any target four mana sacrifice a goblin create two one one red goblin creature tokens it's a two two um this is actually just i mean the deck we just described this is a way to get around the whole attacking problem or so you don't have to play cards like grape shot you could just get away with just playing yeah this is this is much better in that deck when you're not going off you can just play one and search for it with matron yeah and we've we've already seen obviously like uh judith uh judith the scourge diva who's very comparable to pashalik but she doesn't trigger off tokens dying and pashalik will trigger off of goblin tokens dying so in most goblin decks that you would be playing in modern tokens are going to be relevant right Right. tuna red plane bound accomplice human wizard you may put a Planeswalker card from your hand onto the battlefield, sacred it at the beginning of your next end step. It is a 1-3. Marshall's giving a thumbs down. I don't know if I'm on board. Both of you have no faith in every single person on the internet that posted a dope list cheating giant Planeswalkers into play. That's pretty cool, but yeah. I don't think it's that good. People will try it. This is an FNN deck if I've ever heard it. Sure. All right, so so I remember the, the thing that you're supposed to do. So this in Scred decks is the thing, and because you can go infinite with both Chandra and Koth. So if you have two red planeswalkers and they generate one red mana each, you can go back and forth, bringing one into play and bringing the next one into play. Oh, and what's the third what part? Bounces Cloudstone, Curio. Cloudstone. Cloudstone Curio. With Cloudstone Curio. So you bring them both back and forth, one bouncing the other one as enters play, and then eventually you go infinite with Chandra making infinite red mana, or you go infinite doing just damage to them, drawing cards every time. This sounds like a great against the odds deck to so, send to so, Saf. So, so <laughs> Ch- Chandra with this card and any one planeswalker Chandra Torture Defiance gives you infinite Planeswalker activations with Cloudstone Curio. Of the other of the other Planeswalker. Yes, because Chandra makes two red mana and then bounces the other Planeswalker. You put the other Planeswalker in with one of the red mana, bouncing Chandra, and then you put Chandra in with the other red mana, right. bouncing it. Like, and so you right. just like... And that's true of any Planeswalker that makes m- more than one red mana. Right, so, which Chandra, so also does Torture it. Defiance, and Koth of the Hammer are the two that will and, do it. And Xanakos. But you need creatures. You need two creatures. You need one creature in play. Sure. Which he makes. So I guess if you like Xenag, put in Xenagos, zero. Yeah. Put in Chandra, return Xenagos, play Xenagos. Now you have two creatures. Yeah. You do this in Cloudstone and Curio, and then any number of red planeswalkers. It's that are like pieces. a real, it's a real deep four card <laughs> it d- combo. It really does feel like, like, welcome to Against the Odds. <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, well, you but know. it also allows you like like when you're not doing it's it, Cloudstone like Curio, mana. Plane Bound Accomplice, and then your third and fourth pieces have some redundancy, which is nice. But it's uh, it's pretty janky. But I think when you pull it off, your opponents will be very surprised. Yeah. Season Pyromancer, one red red human shaman. When Season Pyromancer enters the battlefield, discard two cards and draw two cards. For each non-land card discarded this way, create a one one red elemental creature token. Three red red exiled Season Pyromancer from your graveyard, create two one one red elemental creature tokens. Um, this card does a lot. It's already seen play in a lot of the grindier Jund and, and Mardu Pyromancer decks. Those decks aren't really good right now due to Hogaki and Karn and the Planeswalker related reasons, but in a world where that isn't happening as often as it is right now, which I can imagine happening by the end of this year, because those are all relatively problematic. Um, this card is pretty powerful. I mean, it, it's it, a good mid-range card. Yeah. It like comes in, technically draws you some cards, also can create tokens by drawing you those cards. We've mentioned a bunch of cards already this episode, not to mention some of those powerful cards in modern history that you want to be discarding regardless, including Lingering Souls and Faithless Looting. Um, and then it itself can be a thing that you discard. Because you can then for five mana get two one one red elemental creature tokens out of yeah, your yeah. It does like an, a pretty good uh, P and Kieran impression, which right. is like, but it's only three mana. 
and it like does a little bit of looty action. Notably, uh, if you have no cards in hand when you play it, uh, you just draw two cards. You just draw two cards, yeah, which is nice. Yeah, so. it's Bedlam Reveler esque in that way. Yeah, it L- does a lot. Little, of little Bedlam, Bedlam Revelry. Like you would play a combination of both, even because um, they do different things. Throws of Chaos, three and a red sorcery cascade, retrace. Now this is a card that Living Den decks have already started playing. Really? Yeah, because it are it allows you to kind of like late game grind them out with red cards they're playing one or two. But pretty much every That's living cool. game player I've talked to has been like, this is a great addition to the deck. I wouldn't um, have guessed that. I think it's mostly because they can get stalled out on lands late game because they're cycling through so many things that it lets them turn their lands that they've cycled into a grip of into cards that are relevant with this. That makes sense. Um, and most of the cards that you're trying to cheat into play are still bigger than four mana. Like four mana isn't that much worse than three as far as the cascade effect goes. Um, for those who don't know, Living End is a card that lets you put all creatures from your graveyard into play. It costs zero, but you uh, can suspend it for four. It doesn't cost zero. It has no mana cost, so you cannot cast it Correct. by paying mana for it. You have to figure out another way to cast it. But all of the Cascade spells can hit it and cast it because it costs... Yes, yeah, Cascade right, is one of the many ways that lets you cheat and cast it when you're not supposed to. Right, and as are other cards like Electro Dominance. Right. Yeah. Finale of the red one. <laughs> I think lets you do the it red too. Finale. finale of Revelation. No. It's right here. If you look at the video, it's showing you right now. The red finale. Yeah, I think it's start. finale of promise. Magmatic sinkhole. Five and a red instant delve. Magmatic sinkhole deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker. Instant. So I have played a fair number of like red mid-range decks with no black in them. Like blue red moon style decks or like um, you played Eternal Command. You've played yeah, CGF, yeah, like Teamer mid range decks, right? And uh, like when creatures have big toughness, and you're pl- you're like not playing black or white, your removal is really bad against them. But this kills most of the high toughness creatures you'd ever need to kill. It kills most Tarmogoyfs. It kills Gurmag Anglers. It kills you're the only creatures I can think of in a world where that's relevant. It kills, kills Tassiger. This and- world, you mean, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Kills Tassigur as it kills. I, th- I think any creature that people are attacking with regularly, like excluding the Grizzle brands of the world. Yeah, it doesn't Emeralds kill like creatures from creatures. Tron or whatever. Yeah. Um, this is great against those. But in, against Tron matchups, you have artifact removal now because yeah. you're in the right colors. And it does say Planeswalker. So in the yes. Tron matchup, it does snipe Planeswalker. If they sure. like Jace Plus to play around Lightning Bolt, you can just like, ha, 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 boom. Blast. Um, and or like most of the Karns die to this. Not most of the Karns. The Four mana Karn dies to this. Yeah. And seven mana Karn dies to this after it's exiled something yeah, of yours. Something. Yeah, which like you're still getting two for one, but fine. Their Karns, you're not going to lose the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two for one, lose the game. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, this card is amazing. I really am glad that it exists because it, like, I've played Roast as a way to deal with big creatures mm-hmm. in some of these like mid range decks where like sometimes Grimmag Angler is just like a problem for you because you're trying to attack on the ground with right. like green idiots like Tarmogoyf or whatever and having being able to just like kill big dumb creatures that are in your way is really nice. I think this is a more playable main deck card than roast. Oh yeah. Uh, Easy. I'm not a fan of roast, right. but I played it <laughs> out of necessity. Um, this is what's interesting about this card. And it's interesting about like delve as a mechanic in general is how swingy it is. Right. Where it's either like, there's like only two cards I can think of, I guess maybe three, if you include Tassiger that are like the happy medium of just fine but otherwise they're like mostly all way too weak because they're just not that good or way too powerful and wizards keeps trying it's like almost worse than storm is because i can come up with interesting storm cards that don't say you win the game on them i don't think i can come up with interesting playable storm cards mm. that aren't too broken that storm is, is hard is storm gra- is worse is, than Delve. is grape shot and empty the warrens is that the happy storm medium i think grape i think well okay so here's a question they keep printing them I mean, we keep getting weird enchantments and artifacts that, for all intents and purposes, say Storm on them. Sure. So Aether Works Reservoir being one. Aether Flux Reservoir. Gen- Ario Flame. Flame. Yeah. Like, they keep printing Storm cards that can kill a player, but they're and, on um, Thousand Year Storm. Thousand Year Storm. I think the key there is spells are so much harder to interact with for non-blue players than permanents are. So sure. it's much easier when you have Storm stapled on a permanent that... If you're holding the proper removal spell, I'm not going to storm off right now. So yeah, I mean, in general, delve. in general for delve, like interactive delve cards tend to be fine because like one mana destroy target creature is not broken. Right. Uh, like logic knot is a delve card. Right. It's interaction. 
Um, no, I mean Logic Knot and Magnetic Scene Cold will see a ton. Logic Knot sees a ton of play. Set Adrift is the is the blue one that started yeah, getting played hotness. in Phoenix. I think Phoenix is now playing this as its delve card sure. of choice. But like you know, depending yeah, think, on the metagame, Set Adrift could be right as well. The I think interaction destroy, is fine because it's not it's not like you're proactively just putting like a freaking Gurmag Angler into play on turn two. You're like, you know answering stuff for one mana which is powerful but not broken crashing footfalls and let me go find it cause... i've seen it getting played in jund with bloodbraid elf it's cool it's not broken like some of the deck like as foretold decks maybe play it but like it's not plays this card but it's not like broken the way like restore balance is where it just like freaking armageddon's your opponent sure. and kills all their creatures and just they discard their hand like <laughs> It's not worth working for that hard, but, but this it's is a also more playable like, card on the front end than yes. balances. Yes, or uh, restore balances. Yes, so the you, fact you that can like, just cat suspend this for green on turn one or two, and it's probably going to be okay as long as you're a deck that's willing to play a long game. Which right. is the reason I've seen it in Jund because they can just suspend it on turn one or two, and it's fine. Sometimes you cascade into it with Bloodbraid Elf, and you freaking like wombo them. Um, so from, it's like a fair card. So, so what the card is? Crashing Footfalls is sorcery. Suspend four for one green. It has zero actual casting cost. Uh, create two four four green rhino creature tokens with trample. Um, and and as we're saying, we said this earlier. Uh, suspend cards with zero convert or no converted mana cost can come into play off of cascade effects. Um, I guess this is a way for like Living End to sideboard into a deck that doesn't care about the graveyard. Yeah. 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 I think it's better in the as foretold version because you're not relying on like you can leave in living end in your deck, mm -hmm. but like this is a threat that is not living end right. that you can cast for free off of as foretold. In the cascade version, you would have to like sideboard out living end or else you're like sometimes cascading into this, sometimes cascading into living end and mm -hmm. you can't control which, which makes things awkward if your opponent has grave hate. Hex drinker, one green snake level up one two one. Uh, base levels, uh, and then you level it up to level three to seven. It's protection from instance. It's a four four. Level it up to eight plus protection from everything six six. For this is the word protection from everything on a card, which has always been fun in Magic history. The one place I've seen is as a cyborg card out of Boggles decks, where they're just like, we need something that isn't as dead to. We need more threats. I don't know. I've seen this being talked about. I have no idea where to play it. I think that it's like a cool green mid-range card, like decks that want to create a single threat and protect it, like in Delver decks in Legacy mm -hmm. or like Nibble Mongoose in Legacy that used to be good. I mean, Nibble Mongoose is in this set, but it's... Much this worse is, than this. <laughs> this is, yeah, this like, you have to invest more mana into it, but like it oh, isn't you know relying on your graveyard and it can get online pretty quickly like it can get online on turn three it's also a two one for one so you can just like attack with it for a couple a couple times and That's if it fine. like eats a bolt like sometimes your one drop eats a bolt right? right like it being only one mana means that like what's the worst that can happen like you right. invest more mana into it but i think this is a card that you just play for one mana it attacks and blocks as a two one if it dies it dies and then later in the game when you have when you have extra mana you're just like you know, pump a man into this pass. Well, and pump and, two man into this pass. I don't think that you like all in this on turn sure. three because then you get blown out. You right? can also use your extra man. Like every turn, you're like, oh, I'll have enough mana to counter a spell or do nothing. And or like I have cast a three drop on turn four. I have one extra mana. Let me just pump it into this. Right. Thing so like three. as a person who like in eternal command, I was thinking about this because you are pretty threat light and the deck is like kind of been looking for another threat. And you're like, you know, you want to hold up mana on your opponent's turn but you can spare a mana here and there and the fact that it's a 2-1 means like it's fine for only one mana sure it's like it's it's above rate and the other thing is like the other deck i thought about as we were talking is the mono green devotion decks or mono green snoppy decks where they're looking for one mana threats that then when they have nykthos online or something else they can then use the scale sure, up like arbor elf utopia sprawl where right. you're just like whoa now i have so much mana, mana. <laughs> pump it into my hex drinker sure it's a good mana and sink. protection from instance is not irrelevant right. protection and from instance is basically hex proof i mean like in modern there's very few sorcery speed right. ways there's like very few sorcery speed targeted removal spells like this could still eat a wrath but like it can also eat a wrath when it's protection from everything yeah, so yeah. <laughs> i think like yeah the the sorcery speed stuff that gets rid of it. Also well, and, and it has four toughness, which right, means so. it'll survive anger, the gods and that ilk slag storm and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, I think the fact that it's just a two, one for one, like it's a, it's a very fair card. Like protection from everything doesn't sound like a fair line of text, but it's a very fair card in that. Like 
it's a creature that you play, it attacks and blocks. It doesn't do anything particularly fast, but it does everything very efficiently, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And there might not really be a place for that right now because modern is kind of fast combo. But, you know, if we go back to a time where like Jund is the best deck, uh, I I think this is a card that is good, maybe not in Jund. I don't know if I agree. I think this actually could see play in Jund just from the perspective that like, Tarmogoyf is worse and worse every day because the graveyard is more and more relevant to make it go away every day. And it just is being outclassed by things. In a world where the graveyard shenanigans are still happening, but Tarmogoyf, but you want something a little bit more beefier. Tarmogoyf is just so efficient. Yeah. Like for two mana with this, you get a two one. I mean, there's upside there. Don't get me wrong. But for two mana with Tarmogoyf, you get like a three, four, four, five, five, six. Well, but sometimes like, with two mana for Tarmogoyf, you get a zero one. Yes, that is true. I mean, this. There's never not a you can play this in a deck where you're a sideboarding rest in peace, one. <laughs> right? Like if you're playing like some type of Abzan mid range or something, and you want to put rest in peace in your sideboard because it's so powerful, right. you can play this as like your threat, your big threat that like you try and beat them up with, and is relatively efficient instead of Goyf because sure. Goyf like is such an awkward spot where you're like, well, do I leave Goyf in my deck and sideboard rest in peace? No, I have to play Leyline of the Void or something that's worse, mm-hmm. and like. Scale up one green sorcery until end of turn. Target creature you control becomes a, ge- a green worm with base power and toughness six four. It has overload four green green. I don't think I'll ever see this. Well, that's not true. No, I might will. see it overloaded. Yeah, I mean, in fact, plays noble hierarchs. They yeah, can yeah. occasionally just like flood out and like use noble hierarch to overload this on a couple of creatures and get them. But more importantly, uh, this just is a big win to infect who needed a big win since they lost cards. Now, Infect has never really gone the way I, I think. Need, I want Infect to have a big win. I think it's... Craig is sad upstairs. He, this is what he wanted. Having now time. having now been scaled up out on more than one occasion playing, like, the fact that Glistener Elf can be like, turn one, Glistener Elf, go. And then you play your turn one land. And then turn two, they play another land. And they go, scale up. Might have old Crowsaw. You're dead. Like, thanks for playing. Like... <laughs> No, no, no. This card is a very big win to Infect. I, the interesting, interesting thing about Infect is people often will talk about how it's gone or not playable, but it's been consistently top six to top eighting every Mythic Championship that comes out. Yeah, so it's, mythic, uh, it's fast enough that fest. it can just dunk on like these ridiculous combo decks that don't play interaction like Hogak or whatever right. because you can just like, yeah, you can just slam dunk somebody on turn two, especially with this card. Yeah. I mean, I just think it, it's not like way better than any of the pump spells that it has but what's a, it's just faster mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it allows you to turn to so much more often because it's basically giving your creature plus five power right it would have done the same thing if if they had just written out one green sorcery target creature gets plus five plus three until well it's turn. worse in multiples right oh I guess like a double true. scale up hand is not as good as a double might of old crows a hand right sure. but it like one of each. Yeah. <laughs> One of each is uh, shuffle up game two. Uh, I'm skipping Spore Frog, and I'm sad about you, it. You said that that had to be on the list. We tried to take it off, and yeah. you were like, no, I want to talk about Spore Frog. We're running out of time. Uh, basically, Genesis is great with Spore Frog. All right, moving past Spore Frog. Collector, oof. One green and one generic mana for a creature, oof. Activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. It is a 2-2. It's Stony Silence on a green creature that can be tutored and put into play in like 80 different ways that I can yep, think of. It'll it's, be a sideboard card forever. forever. Yeah. And it's already seeing mo- uh, some some main deck plays as like a one of in these decks that are playing. Yeah, Collect a Company and stuff. Collect a Company yeah. and Elder's Evolution. That's sort of stuff. Artifacts are just super relevant now too. So yeah, I just this card will see play forever. If you were thinking of playing Stony Silence and winning it in green and wanted it to be easier to find. Uh, Weather the Storm. Excuse me. Uh, green one. Instant. You gain three life. Storm. Um, so long rant on this online that I can shorten basically, but, um, a sideboard card, people are already playing the gain five life. If you have a four power creature or more gain 10 life cards. And this in many of those situations is better. If not better, it is like against burn. It is maybe slightly worse, but then better against other matchups like storm. So this is a little bit of a sideboard card against storm because it just wrecks their grape shot. They like no longer can kill you. There are other matchups like Phoenix where this puts them very far behind by playing it against them. The other place I've seen this being talked about is in playing not necessarily storm decks, but decks that go off with Aetherflux Reservoir. Is that right? Or other decks like that where it's just gaining a bunch of life. And then also more importantly is Grizzle Brand decks. 
because those decks just want to gain a bunch of life, cast a bunch of spells in one turn, and being able to gain anything over seven life in that deck reads draw seven cards. And so the, you're playing this card in those decks as well. Did you see the super spicy Conley brew with uh, four Bolas's Citadel uh, and that oh, card the decks is the other card and then Ooh. one aether flux reservoir and like war of invention to like search for your artifacts and then like some mana rocks and stuff it was super sweet because you can just like go off with bolus of citadel and cast this and like just gain a bajillion life and then it had like the one ace flux reservoir you could search for to like Good blow them up yeah i yeah, love the sound that. of it because i'm i'm loving playing the um the explorers in a bolus yeah. like a golgari explorers build in standard right now is just so much fun and the this is yeah this is like the more explosive modern version i'll send you a list marshall uh next card winding way green one sorcery choose creature or land reveal the top four cards of your library put all cards of the chosen type revealed this way into your hand and the rest into your graveyard um Really, the main place I've heard anyone talking about this is in Elves, just as a slightly more mana efficient, or if you're behind, better um, card than Lead the Stampede, because yeah. Lead the Stampede costs three, this is two. You can so also grab lands, which is relevant. If yep. you like, you can like keep a one lander with an Elf with this. Like, you don't necessarily want to keep that, because if your Elf dies, you might lose. But if you've got a five mana and you need, like, yeah. you figure it I mean, out. I mean, like, it just adds a little bit of consistency being only two mana and finding lands. Like, it digs one less deep. But you get I don't know. four versus five. And the thing is, like on card draw spells, you want them to be cheaper because you want to be able to play the cards the turn you get them. Like if you if you like are tapping down to one mana with lead the stampede and you see like an elvish arch druid, you're like, mm. but right. this card allows you to like play the cards that you're getting a little bit faster because it's only two mana. Now you're drawing less cards, but I think it's better than lead the stampede. It's also like a huge house in pauper elves, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Well, because they, they don't didn't have, have lead the stampede. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ayula's Influence. Green, green, green. Enchantment. Discard a land card. Create a 2-2 green bear creature token. The real conversation is Seismic Assault versus this. Um, Seismic Assault is a better combo piece, and people have pointed out that it also is good with Briars of Argol. Swans, Swans. of Bryn Argol. Sure. Uh, never was going to say that card correctly. <laughs> um, but the thing that kind of on the back end is this card is, I think, a more powerful card than that just because in general, a 2-2 bear is better than Shock. Like over time, it'll do more damage. It also like the deck's biggest problem is often you're casting this three man enchantment that doesn't do anything. And if the thing that they're attacking with you with is anything bigger than an X2, you're kind of just SOL. You have no way of killing it. And this allows you to just chump block every turn with the lands, eventually getting off with a um, life from the loam, being able to disco those cards, getting six power every turn off of that effect. And yeah, then go so off with basically, it. I don't think that I would ever play this card unless life from the loam is in my deck. And it being on color with life from the loam is very valuable because casting seismic assault in those decks is doable, but it's a little rough. Right. Because if you want to play like the assault loam deck, kind of like mid rangey value, grind them out with life from the loam, maybe you have Raven's Crime, Urborg, some, some stuff like that. Like, you're just it's tough to cast a triple red but mm -hmm. i think triple green is like super doable in those right. decks well now you don't even like those decks always like had to play red right because seismic assault was the only real good yeah. engine card to be able to do with it like countryside crusher too countryside well but countryside crusher has i, I don't think it's ever i've yeah, never it, seen it really people used to play it in like yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um but <laughs> it's in modern, probably not not the biz like it was always kind of just like is this card like now you don't have to play red. You can go into yeah. other colors. You can be, you know, uh, salt eye playing black, blue, and, and green, where you get a bunch of really powerful cards. Or you can just be green black. You can just be green black. You could be mono green. Mono green is probably the worst and of you those. You can still play red if you want. I just think that like, you know, green lands are going to be better than red lands anyway right. because you're splashing red. And then, but this is like worse than seismic assault in situations where you're like comboing, drawing your whole deck, sure. right? Like right. in the swans deck where you're looking to like draw tons of cards off of swans and then just chuck your lands at them. Making ten bears is not as good right. as dealing. But that deck was always damage. hard because you're trying to play triple red, green, and either double white or double blue. Yeah, versus, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying yeah, Swans yeah. is an amazing deck, but, well, but like, like this card gets you get raw combo. I'm trying to think of situations where this is better than Seismic Assault. And I think it's better if you're like grinding and it's worse if you're comboing. Well, but with combo with get raw, you go infinite with if you have the Delve Land. Like that's a three card combo. Sure. Is, but if you're doing that, Seismic Assault just kills them and this makes a bunch of bears. Well, I guess you can find another way to win if you're drawing your whole deck. Yeah, yeah. You're drawing through your whole deck and putting all of it into the graveyard. I feel like I can win the game regardless. I and just think that like do it. if your combo piece is also your win condition, it saves slots in your deck. So you're not like in a situation where you're like, sure. oh, no, I drew my lightning storm or like <laughs> I have two Simeon Spirit Guides well, in my opening that's, hand that's and nothing you, to power yeah, right. out or oh, something. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, sure. 
Genesis. Four and a green at the beginning of your upkeep. If Genesis is in your graveyard, you may pay two and a green. If you do return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand, Obviously, you mentioned it was Spore Frog earlier. Otherwise, I think this is a like a rebuyable card engine out of your graveyard. I don't think it's very good right now. But yeah, it think... just sits in your graveyard and does nothing until the extreme late game when you like can generate a bunch of value. Right. And, but and I just I think don't think that, that very many modern that. decks play out like that. Plus, the graveyard is such a fragile zone in modern. I think it was better in a, in standard because the graveyard was not as fragile. I think this card would be better in modern two years ago. Probably. I think this deck might be better in modern two years from now if the metagame changes away from the graveyard. But sure, we'll there see. are going to need to be big changes for that to happen. It is a, and I'll say this about regrowth as well as Genesis. I, I think that they're cool cards, and I hope somebody finds something cool to do with them. Right. They don't really fit in right now, and I don't see a world where they fit in. Mm-hmm. But if somebody Actually, figures it out, I'm glad that they exist. So, so they're, re- they're powerful and interesting. They're just like not quite there to me. On regrowth, the storm Aetherflux Reservoir deck isn't the worst place for that card. Yeah, I guess you have to play green anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you did skip story. over Deep story. Forest Hermit, which I feel like is, I mean, five mana puts five bodies into the play doesn't seem irrelevant, but maybe I'm wrong. No, oh, the Hermit, a, a five mana value card that doesn't just win you the game. I don't think we'll see play. Okay. You can you can reanimate it with like Vesper Lark or. Uh, Freaking oh, Revelar. Ooh, Vesper. You can get Lark. it back with Vesper Lark. You can get it back with like they have been printing a lot of white cards that reanimate small creatures. So having a small creature that is nine power but only one like sure. power for yeah. the purposes of reanimation is something. It being a one power creature that does that much means that you can reanimate it with a lot of these white reanimator cards like Vesper Lark and Revel Arc. But like as they print more of these white cards, there might be like some type of mid rangey you know, collected company style deck, maybe not with collected companies and some of these cards are too expensive, but I don't know. It's, it is interesting that it is like the biggest one power creature that exists, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's something. Mm-hmm. So that's fair. Okay. We're done with green. So now let's do lands and then we'll be done for the episode. Cause I don't think we have time to do gold and artifacts. Sure. Uh, first card is the cycling card cycle. So these are five lands, Baron Moore, Forgotten Tranquil Cave, Thicket. Tranquil Thicket, Lonely Sandbar, and Secluded Step. And all of them enter the battlefield tap. You can tap them to create a mana of that one color. So one of all five colors. And they have cycling for the color. Um, obviously, the red, green. Well, I guess everyone but the white one is exciting to me. And even the white one. Maybe the is. white one is the color of Astral Drift. So, yes. Sure. All five are exciting. I mean, yeah. So, like... They're the best cyclers out there because they can put, come to play as lands, which is important, and they, they trigger all the cycling effects. They're really good in lands decks because Loam can rebuy them, and then you can just use them as a huge card draw engine, making it... So, like, imagine you have an Iula's Influence in play. You play Loam, get back two lands plus one of these. You cycle it to get back Loam again. Yeah. Get back three lands, and then you make four, five bears for five mana. Ten mana, five mana. Five mana for Ten five power, bears. five mana. I mean, if you're, like, a mid-range deck that's looking to... T- close out the game after you've been chumping with bears for a mm-hmm. while that's that's five bears yeah 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 <laughs> that's that's five <laughs> bears that. if you have, if like you the fact that you can dredge bears. off of the cycle makes these super good with life in the loam right because right. if you need to dig for an answer you can life from the loam them back and then cycle them and that's kind of slow and not very mana efficient but also you can just play them as lands you can use them to dredge back loam and loam even more i they, mean i mean and, and they and do stuff they also allow you to play with 30 lands that make it so you don't get you can like completely get rid of mana screw or not completely get rid of but really mitigate it and then if you get mana flooded they cycle away to be able to yeah and it only one mana they're like more efficient them coming to play tapped and like having to spend your mana to cycle lands is pretty slow. So I don't think they're going to get played in like large numbers and lots of decks. Sure. But I think in a deck with where you're specifically like a slow grindy deck, playing life in the loam, playing a high land count, take Mm -hmm. advantage of your, I lose influence and whatever other cards to make sure that you can have three lands in your graveyard. When you get the loam, it's relevant. Yeah. Next is the horizon cycle of land. So for those who don't know, horizon canopy is a green white card from future Sight. Uh, that allowed you to uh, tap it, pay one life to create green or white mana, and then or you can pay one mana and tap it to sacrifice it and draw a card. Now, um, this is a much better way to up your land count in your deck and yes. play 25 or 26 lands if you are interested because you can... Well, let me explain the fact that there are five of them now all in enemy colors. So you have all five enemy colored of lands. So now there are six lands in the format that do this. Now, now continue with what you're going to say. Yeah, so these allow you to play more lands and avoid mana screw because if you draw too many lands, you can sacrifice them. Now, what's better about them is they come in untapped. 
Mm -hmm. um, and they also retroactive, right? Like if I, you don't have a turn one play, so then you play your Baron more tapped, and then you flood out, you're screwed because your Baron more is already in play. Right. Well, I think. But you want if you play Fiery Islet on turn one, for one thing, it enters untapped. For another thing, it like you just sack it later when mm -hmm. you flood out. Like you get to play it and worry about flooding later. Whereas the cycling lands, you have to hold them so that if you flood, then you cycle them. And what's awkward about them is like, you'll hold it, hold it. And then it's like, oh no, now I don't have four mana on turn four because this is my fourth land because I was holding it. And then you're like, Ooh. right. And Whereas this card, card, you do have four mana on turn four and you can sack it to draw a card. Well, now it's worse with like life in the loam and stuff like that because it, it's worse, but it's not bad. Like you, because you do get to sacrifice it to put in your graveyard. Then Loam can get it back, and you can use that as a card. But that engine. uses up your land drop Correct. for a turn. You and cycling you doesn't off. use up your land drop. So if you're looking to like cycle multiple lands in a turn, or play a land and cycle a land each turn, you can do that with Life in the Loam, mm -hmm. and you cannot do that with these cards because they take up your land drop for the turn. But what you can do, these are better generically for until you start comboing off with the Life in totally. the Loam, where like you're like, oh, I have one Loam. I'm not. I don't have any engine with Loam. I don't have anything to do with it, but I can just like. Sack this to trigger loam, buy it back, put it back into play, get cards into my graveyard. Um, and some other things, uh, before these were printed, Horizon Canopy was the fifth most play, or the, I think the fourth most played land in modern. It was like yeah. two basics, uh, fetch land, and um, one shock, the black red shock. So it was, in, or it was in the top 10, I think. Protecting you from mana flood at such a low cost is really relevant. Now, the cost of the card is that you, you pay life, when you you pay pay life which means that like, Right now, I mean, obviously, like, there's other big players in the format, but I think that people are going to be, like, playing these lands a lot in their decks, and I feel like that makes decks that are attacking your opponent's life total a little bit more interesting mm -hmm. to me, like Burn or Phoenix or something like that, because a lot of your opponents are going to be playing these lands in their deck, possibly at higher numbers than is appropriate, because they're new and people want to try them out. And, like, this is more of an f &M level thing, whereas if you're playing, like, at a GP, people are going to have like, you know, people are going to have tested their decks a lot more. Right. But at FNM, where people are like trying out their new interesting stuff, you like, if you are playing a deck that attacks your opponent's life total, I feel like there's going to be more people playing these in higher numbers. Hall of Hilliard's uh, Generosity is the next card. Legendary Land. Tap it to add one colorless. Uh, you may tap one white and one colorless to tap it, put target enchantment card from your graveyard on top of your library. So this is Academy Ruins, but for enchantments in white right. versus in blue and artifacts. So the, where you see Academy Ruins get played in modern is usually in prison decks, and they use it to rebuy their prison pieces when they get destroyed. So it's like... If I have out a, you know, Chalice of the Void or whatever on one, and it's super good against your deck, but you sideboard it against me and you like play your, you know, artifact destruction card mm -hmm. that costs two mana, you play your nature's chant or whatever to blow it up. And then I can just rebuy it and replay it mm -hmm. to like continue to lock you out, right? Uh, this is the same thing for enchantments. So if there was a prison deck that was playing more enchantments, like, you know, ghostly prison and rule of law and stuff like that. You can use this to like rebuy important enchantments that your opponent kills. I don't think that there is a good deck like that in modern right now, but the fact that this exists means that it gives potential future enchantment lockout decks a little bit more resilience against uh, hate cards that artifact decks already enjoy. Sure. And I think there's also like, we're going to go back to Theros. There's going to be a bunch of different enchantment themed stuff that comes out and this is a very powerful tool i mean like there's a the the this is the third version of this card printed there's one that's not in modern it's on the reserve list so it will never be in modern um for creatures but like there's all of the artifact enchantment or constellation cards from theros block and journey in the Nix that like have always been on the edge of enchantress playable but could this could be or a card like this or more effects like this could get them over i the mean top. i think this card is like slow because you don't draw the card you just put it on top you pay three mana mm -hmm. to put a card on top which means even if you like pay to put the card on top you play like a serum visions or something to draw it you've now spent four mana to even get it in your hand sure then you have to play it well you do it strikes me more as a card where like you are locking your opponent out of the game so you have tons of mana because you're just like ah, play land every turn anything. ah you're not yeah. doing anything it also protects you from decking so it allows those prison decks to win by decking sure like the lantern control decks will often just win by like land go land go land go okay i have no cards left academy ruins my whatever back right and well that's also a win condition where they you know if, if say you're milling your deck faster than your opponent or whatever reason you can then use the pirate, the spell, pirate bomb. spell bomb to or just spell bomb them use, every turn until they die. Yeah, the enchantment version. 
Seal of Fire. Seal of Fire. Use Seal of Fire to just kill your opponent to death. Yeah, but it strikes me as a prison card. I sure. mean, that's who's playing Academy Ruins right now, and I feel like that's going to be who's playing this. <laughs> the one other thing I can see is, like, in a deck that's playing land tutors, like Night of the Relic Warrior or something, this can be a way to rebuy sideboard cards. Mm -hmm. So you can, like just play one of these in your main deck that might not even do anything game one, but game two, here's Stony Silence. Right. Here's I tutor for Hall of Heliod's generosity. Can you beat this? Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I also think like the other place I've maybe thought about it was in, in boggles decks or things using the totem armor things that just make it. So you like, no matter what you do, this creature is never going to die. Now they don't want extra colorless mana because they're so color intensive. Yeah, and I think those are pretty low impact to get back. Like, if you're skipping your draw step to draw something and you're paying three mana, I feel like it has to just, like, dominate the game. It has to be, like, sure. a Chalice of the Void or, like, a, like a you know, Rest in Peace, Stony right. Silence like type. Law or any of those are going to do much farther. Yeah. Than that. I mean, I guess the other side is that it also can buy creatures back. There, there are creatures out there that are enchantment creatures. I don't think any of them are good, though. There's the Rule of Law one. Sure. That's also a Rule of Law, though. You could do either of those, whichever, sure. you know. <laughs> I like attacking for one man, one damage sometimes. All right. Prismatic Vista. Land, pay one life, sacrifice Prismatic Vista. Search your library for a basic land card. Put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Um, this has already started seeing play, kind of surprisingly. I guess not surprisingly. It does a bunch of relevant things. Um, the snow decks are the big one right now just because it finds the snow mana base needed to be able to play three color snow decks right so if you're playing like a green blue even a third color snow deck with like the codal in it you get your like misty rainforests to fetch basics but you also get these to fetch basics now right. you have eight fetches and that's basically where you want to be in modern to have a consistent mana base a lot of the time yeah so this lets you kind of get the things you weren't previously able to get gets wastes um, adds the delve. It does kind of everything that a fetch land does. It just finds basics versus. There's going to be a lot of mana bases that are just playing like one of these as their ninth fetch land right. or something like that because, like, they, you know, if you're playing Mardu and you have like four Marsh Flats, four Bloodstained Myers, and you want one more land, you're like, well, I could play Polluted Delta, but it doesn't get my planes. And uh, like, especially Blood Moon decks or stuff like that. Right. Like, even if you're not playing Blood Moon, I think that the fact that fetching for basics is one of the main things that fetch lands are good for in modern. It's the reason that you don't just play like four blood crypt, four blood dragon skull summit sure, or whatever. Right. In part because, you know, dragon skull summit's a little bit less consistent entering untapped. Well, blood moon exists, but, so you want to be able to fetch but basics. Playing fetches, yeah, playing fetches to be able to fetch for basics against blood moon is really important. Sure. And I think a lot of decks are going to play this as like a ninth or tenth fetch yeah. land, and snow decks are going to play it as their main fetch land. Yeah. And some blood moon decks are probably going to play it as like four of these and three blood saint mire or something. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really powerful. Um, uh -huh. All right, so that's it for the uh, episode or review. So we have artifacts and gold cards left. We're going to figure out when we're going to review those. It'll happen eventually. Uh, our preview episode is next week. I don't know if we'll be doing the rest of the review then. I'll we'll be waiting for the following week, or there might just be a double episode at some point that we'll figure out. Um, we're also going to be at GP Seattle. I meant to mention that earlier. I won't um, be there. We will also... <laughs> <laughs> It'll just be the other host, Ben. <laughs> Um, and we just have a bunch of content coming out. Really excited. Make sure to check out the Patreon. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at uh, Cass Wiley. Uh, I'm at Dudard, D-U-D-A-R-D. And we are collectively at the MM Cast. You can follow the third host, Ben Bateman, at Ben Bateman Media. Uh, on pretty much everything, Instagram, everything else. Make sure if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're not watching on YouTube, subscribe and hit the bell. We're going to do live streams more often. Ben's trying to do it once a week and I'm going to try doing that as well. Um, it's an unpredictable schedule for the live streams currently though. So if you want to be in on it, it yeah. helps to have the notifications. Yeah, hit the bell, hit the bell so you get the push. Uh, and thanks so much. Check out the Patreon, check everything else out. Make sure to check out the Command Zone. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you for your attention. See you later, alligator. This has been a production of Time Traveler Media, sending podcasts into the future.